everyone's favourite segment, isn't it, Sagan? Yeah. Yeah. Who, who is that for? It's for... Who's that package for? Me! It's for you! Who's it from? Um... We don't know, do we? No. No. But we do know where it's from. It's from Tyrone, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Can you say that? Tyrone, Pennsylvania. Awesome. You want to open it up? Yeah. All right, Sagan, let's open it, yeah? Yeah. You excited? Yeah? It's actually from N3ZVT. Can you say that? N3ZT. ZVT. That's pretty close. Yeah. I think that's a ham radio call sign. Yes. Yeah? Are you a ham? Yeah. You're a ham, are you? <laughs> You're the world's youngest ham. Yeah? No, not yet. You want to have a look inside? Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, N3ZVT. And it is addressed to Sagan. So what we'll do, we'll open it up, won't we? Yeah? We don't know what's inside. No, we don't. What do you think it might be? I don't know. Have a guess. Mm, I don't know yet. Oh, yeah. You can't guess? No. Would it be another box, maybe? Yes! Whoa! What, what is it? Whoa! We have got lots of things! Lots of things? Here, yeah. look! It's a flying disc! Awesome! Oh, you throw it and it flies. And, look! It's made in the USA! Can you say USA, USA, USA? USA, USA. USA. <laughs> well done, Sagan. All right, who's it from? Let's have a look. It's from Steve. Thank you very much, Steve. Say thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. All right. Sagan, I don't know if you are or will be athletic. Yes, he is. You're good at sports aren't you here is a device that is very popular on u.s college campuses and beaches it would also be useful if your family had a medium to large dog we don't have a dog do we sagan no, no we don't mummy doesn't let us have a dog does she no. no give the red one to your father and tell him it will enhance his panavice junior oh this one it'll enhance my panavice junior how does it enhance my panavice junior not sure. Sits on top. It's got some. It's got feet. Are they their feet, right? So it sits in there like that. I don't get it. Hmm. Here we go. Look at that. And look, it's a frisbee. frisbee. Well, it's not a genuine. Well, it's a can jam. Never heard of a can jam, but it's a fish. The official can jam disc. And no, this one's for Daddy. That one's Sagan's. You ready? I think you throw it. You want to try and throw it? Yeah. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Go. Uh. Not quite. You, <laughs> you throw it like this. Like that. It's all in the wrist action. Can you show me, Daddy? Okay. Could hit the camera. Ready? Woo! Wow! wow. Thanks, Steve. It's annoying. It's a Lorian, yeah. De Lorian. De Lorian. They turn. They turn. Because it's a flying annoying. Next up, we have one from Michael Kelly. Thank you very much, Michael. He's from Williamton in Massachusetts. Hi to all my Massachusetts viewers. Is that the correct term? I don't know if everyone from Massachusetts. I wonder how many viewers I've got in the state of Massachusetts. How many people are there in Massachusetts anyway? No idea. Sorry, I don't know my uh, US uh, statistics all that well. So thank you very much, Michael. Let's see what he sent. Nicely packaged in the um, crumpled paper. Mm, mm, I like who it's from, as in the manufacturer. Um, oh, okay. Yep. Ta-da! It's a Fleur VP50 voltage stick. And if I remember rightly, um, Michael might have emailed me about this and said that it was, he's, there was something wrong with it, perhaps. 
Um, anyway, he's a mechanical engineer um, who occasionally plays the part of an electrical engineer. Yeah, well, I've been an electrical engineer who occasionally plays the part of a mechanical engineer. Um, not very well. So he works in um, the power electronic solar grid tie inverter industry. He says they use a lot of FLIR stuff, you know, the FLIR cameras, as you'd expect, um, in engineering, as you do. But he thought he'd test what, the, what their products, um, ele electrical products division, is like with this uh, VP50 non-contact voltage sensor and he says it's much too sensitive it picks up 120 volts ac 60 hertz of course from six inches away and of course that is absolutely no good um he contacted fleur and surprisingly they got back to him and claimed that i had an overly sensitive defective unit i was doubtful that i somehow had an oversensitive unit i thought their design was way off they sent me two replacements but they performed the same as the first there you go. Woohoo! Interesting. That's sort of like classic marketing technique. Marketing have no idea. Oh, sorry. You know, support have uh, no idea what's uh, what what's going on. They couldn't be bothered to really check into it and check with engineering. So they just go, oh yeah, you've probably got an oversensitive unit. Let's you know, fall faulty in some way. Let's just send you another one. And of course, it performs exactly the same way. And well, yeah. A dollar for every time that's happened. Jeez. Anyway, let's check it out. Thank you very much, Mike. So here we go. Let's check this thing out. Now, it may very well not have been developed by Fleur themselves. They may have just uh, bought it from somebody else, from a um, manufacturer. I don't know who, but I can't say I've actually seen one like that before. And it's interesting that it's got a torch, which doesn't seem to work. In fact, the batteries seem flat. Let's take this out. So it may not be... Hey, that's interesting. Check it out. We've got three contacts there. Three contact points. And, oh, look, that must... Yeah, that spins around like that. That's rather neat. How that... Uh, the three contacts down in there goes in there like that. And that spins around. Hey, I don't mind that at all. But anyway, these batteries must be flat. So let me try it out. Here we go. I got it working. And this thing just vibrated. This thing vibrates. It's got a vibration alert, which is kind of jazzy, I guess. It's got an LED in the end like that. But anyway, let's, yeah, look, it's going off. It doesn't beep. Why doesn't it beep? So let's compare it with the industry standard fluke volt alert here, which everyone trusts. And you'll notice we plug this in to each of these pins. It only comes on when it is right near the active, so it's very discriminatory in that aspect. Now, if we have a look at this, now, according to the manual, it's got a normal mode, which is the green one, and sure enough, that, you know, it, it works, okay, but it's it's much more sensitive than the uh, Fluke Volt Alert here, and, and then you put it into red mode, and this is supposed to be a high sensitivity mode, and it damn well is. Everything sets it off, and it actually tells you this in the manual. Note, static electricity and other stray sources of energy can randomly trigger the sensor. This is normal. Random trigger is more likely in high sensitivity mode, uh, but certainly can occur in the normal sensitivity mode as well. Oh, well, gee, thanks a lot. And it tells you that a red flashing light is like a malfunction on the thing. So, like, I, ah, oh, it's just, it's ridiculous. So, I'm not going to go and say that this thing is unsafe because it's it's not failing to detect okay it's doing its job but it's just too bloody sensitive just like mike said oh hopeless don't like that at all thumbs down fleur and a quick two minute tear down here is the thing it, do, it, it does say the vp50 vp52 so maybe it is a fleur design there's no indication that it's uh, made by somebody else we've got an mcp uh, 60021 on there that's a microchip uh probably an op amp um i off the top of my head i'm pretty sure that's what it would be you've got to have some sort of gain stage on the front there there's our two leds and our sensor post there is more um sensors inside uh like the ex sensor extends out inside the probe uh tip itself we've got our extra surface mount leds on here the soldering is not great on this thing at all. I can see, look, there's a bit of solder missing from that puppy up there. Don't real 
really like that. It's not instilling a lot of confidence in me. Anyway, that is a completely unbranded chip. I have no idea what that one is. I've looked under the man of scope. Uh, nothing obvious at all. So, yeah, I'm <laughs> not impressed at all. And there's our vibrator motor on the back end. I, I don't understand why it doesn't have a buzzer, though. That's just, uh, okay, you've got a, a, a vibrator on there, maybe. But if you're using, like, gloves, for example, you may not, I don't know, I can I can picture you may not um, feel in the vibration, perhaps. But it, it's reasonably strong, but, yeah, nah, give me the fluke any day. By the way, the torch does work, just silly me didn't uh, hold down the button. That's actually a nice uh, touch so that it uh, can't accidentally get turned on in your toolbox. But, geez, yeah, not happy at all. That's, I mean, the six inches Mike's talking about or whatever. Yeah, in high sensitivity mode, it's useless in high sensitivity mode. Absolutely useless. But, you know, it does the job, but, geez, it's just... It's just way too sensitive. Oh, it's not discriminatory enough for my liking. And sensitive to static electricity? Yep, I was e easily able to set that off. The fluke? Nope, not at all. Well, I can if I really go vicious at it, but it doesn't seem to be nearly as sensitive as that fluke. Next up, we have one from Australia. Yes, I accidentally opened it, but I, um, because I got a whole bunch of um stuff, and I had some other stuff which I knew wasn't mailbag in my PO box, and I accidentally opened this one, but I didn't actually take it out. So truly, I have no idea what's in here. This one comes from C Dongs. Donga, call you Donga. No worries. He's from Collingwood Park in Queensland, and uh, he sent it to that crazy Austrian bloke. <laughs> Is that an insult? No, oh, I like the Austrians. Hi Dave, I found this old, haha. -ha. Scion 3A organizer. There we go. While cleaning up, um, I used it for many years and think the calendar app is still the best he's ever used. There you go for all you Scion fanboys. I was a Scion uh, fanboy. It powers on, but there are lines over the screen. I thought we could be a teardown if there's a slow week. Awesome. I, yeah, I've got the um, Scion 5. Um, I loved the Scion 5. Its keyboard was um, more full, um, not, not full size, but the keys were like uh, much larger than that with no gaps in between them, like this um, Scion 3. But uh, yeah, I just loved the clamshell design like that and how it slides out. Anyway, the Scion 5 is even cooler than that in its mechanical aspects, how the keyboard actually pops up and slides out. I might have shown it on the blog a long time ago. I'm not sure. Anyway, it had a massive two megabytes of RAM, 1993, made in the old Dart as well. So, beauty. Is that a, you reckon that's a two minute teardown or should I save it? Hmm. Three, thank you very much, Chris. I will actually leave this for a separate teardown because I'd like to compare it with my Scion uh, 5. So I think I'll leave that. You can see that that hinge. You can see the uh, the touch buttons in there. And uh, the Scion 5 is actually much, much better than this. So I've got to dig it out. The archive, like the keyboard, like pops out and extends. And I'm sure I've shown it uh, before. It's got lots of uh, PCMCIA um, expansion on the thing, which was fantastic back in the days. And it ran forever. Well, you know, ran for like 20 hours. Oh, I'm not sure of the battery life of this one, but the Scion 5, I think I was getting like, you know, 24 hours solid out of a couple of AA batteries or something. It lasts uh, last forever. And um, the Scion 5 had a much better keyboard than this uh, Scion 3, but these organizers were the duck's guts back in the day, and it had Word and uh, Spreadsheet and Agenda. As uh, Chris said, he reckons it's got one of the best... Um, uh, calendars and things like that, internet calculator, spreadsheet, the whole works, and these things were really the duck's guts back in the day. Pe uh, you know, people love these things, and uh, they worked really well. In fact, I wrote a good percentage of my book back in the day on this, around about 2,000. Next up, one from Tom Budcar. He's from RFR Diagnostics, LLC, in Niskayuna, in New York. <coughs> Can't pronounce that to save my life. Anyway, let's see what Thomas said. Thank you very much. 
And for those who complain that I cut towards myself, it's all right. I'm a professional. I know what I'm doing. I'm Australian. No worries. All right. What do we got? What's Tom said? Awesome. We have a shirt. Danger. RF radiation. Oop, there we go. Brilliant. And that's his um, company, RF Diagnostics, LLC. There we go. Awesome. And nice, nice grey. I like a good grey. Aren't I boring? Um, and he sent some little, oh, RF DC converters. Mm, interesting. Oh, right. I've somebody else sent in uh, one of these, and um, awesome. I actually had, yeah, somebody already sent that one in, RF Diagnostics. It's one of those RF energy harvesting ones. Somebody sent that on the mail bay, so I've now got two of those. I did try and hook it up, and I wasn't get. I was going to do a video on it, and wasn't getting much luck at all with it. So I'm not sure what the deal was. I've got another one to play with, and uh, we've got a microwave energy detector. There we go. So I've got two of those to play with and um, it's got a 2.5 gig dipole antenna on it of course and it's got a light emitting diode oh how neat right so it just yeah when you put it next to a uh, a wireless LAN antenna or something like that it should light up neat so yes wireless RF energy harvesting is a real thing you can actually get some energy out of RF fields like that but of course, this is where all the charlatans come in, and I busted this way back, like five years ago. I'll link in the video down below of RCA, who um, had a wireless mobile phone charging thing with, they could, you know, claim you could recharge your mobile phone with energy from your Wi-Fi signals. And I did the math on it, and it is complete and utter bullshit. But that doesn't stop people doing it again. Just yesterday, somebody posted on the EUV blog forum, and I'll link it in down below. There's a Kickstarter project from some idiot who thinks that you can, once again, charge your mobile phone with Wi-Fi signals. And it's just absolute bullshit, because it's about the... Oh, anyway, watch the video down below. So anyway, yes, complete and utter garbage. The amount of energy you get out of these things is absolutely minuscule, which is fine for some, you know, ultra-low, and I'm talking ultra-low power um, sensor applications and things like that, um, uh, where RF energy can be a real useful uh, thing. RF energy harvesting or maybe RF as part of some other energy harvesting uh, aspects um, as well. You might be able to, you know, a Peltia device, you might be able to harness heat, you might be able to harness vibration, you know, uh, solar, whatever. RF might be another one on top of there. But yeah, these are neat little kits if you want to experiment with RF energy harvesting. So I'll link them in down below. Thank you very much, Tom, for sending this in. Check out RF Diagnostics and hopefully I'll do a uh, video on it, actually experimenting with these things and maybe getting some uh, useful uh, performance data out of it. And as Tom said, this little RF module here uses a voltage multiplier and it rectifies anything from 60 hertz to 6 gig and it'll create a DC voltage out um, by doing that. Claims greater than 50% efficiency depends how you're coupling that in with the antenna. If you've got some resonant antenna that's, you know, coupled at the right frequency, all that sort of stuff, yeah, you can get a reasonable efficiency. Otherwise, yeah, it's generally going to be fairly poor. But uh, yeah, 50%, you know, it can be achieved. But once again, 50% one meter away from a Wi-Fi antenna, even if you were getting 50% with uh, something like this, then it's bugger all. Just do the math. Watch the video I've done and you'll realize you can't extract much power at all, but you can extract some. And I've got my Wi-Fi router here. So let's hook our little board up. And ta-da! Look at that. It's starting to flash. You've got to get pretty close, though, a couple of centimeters. So there you go. As you see, it... Uh certainly does work hopefully you can hopefully you can see that anyway it does flash and um i don't think that flashing is any sort of anything to do with like the packet nature of the um of any <laughs> your wi-fi signal or anything like that i think the fact that it's just got maybe a smaller powder small amount of output capacitance on the die itself and then it's start uh, charging that up of course and then it's just briefly flashing the lead and then dropping back down and uh 
yep and then so it's just doing that that's just the nature of uh just the charging i believe you can actually put like an external charge cap on the thing to build up a bit more charge and then uh, dump it now tom seems to think that you can do this if you hold it up to your tablet well this isn't a tablet it's a mobile phone it is connected via wi-fi but i can't find any point that will actually light that sucker up maybe if i turn the lights off i might be able to see the lead go on but yeah not in this case but anyway in theory you could and an interesting little factoid uh that the uh wire leads on a standard leaded resistor are just the right length for a 2.5 gig dipole antenna there you go so he has trimmed these to the right length to be um uh just like at the right length for that 2.5 gig wi-fi signal so it'll detect uh you know microwave oven leakage and things like that i don't have a microwave oven here in the lab so i can't test that but awesome thanks tom links down below Next up, one from Ryan Nolte. He's from uh, Alexander's Digital Printing, I think it is. Um, from Linden in Utah. Oh, wow, I don't think we've had one from Utah in quite some time. It's sort of like already opened. I oh yeah, there we go. Open by UTS for quarantine inspection. There you go. Being quarantine inspected for my protection. So thank you very much, Ryan. Let's take a look here. It's well padded. It's well and truly padded. It's got like 10 layers of. Oh no, here we go. There we go. There we go. It's obviously fragile. So, didn't have a fragile sticker on it, but. Uh, ooh, oh, look. Sweet. Looks like we've got ourselves some bug. Some. Bar graphs, good old-fashioned Nixie chew. Oh, I can't focus on that because my sorry, but yeah. As you see, I've sent you some IN9 in-9 bar graph Nixie tubes. These particular tubes are argon filled, so they'll glow purplish when energized. Exclamation mark next to that. I bought these for a project to use, and no, no use for the remaining three. Perhaps you can find a use for me. Yeah, was going to send four, but he uh, sent three instead. What's the asterisk when energized? Asterisk. Ooh, jazzy. Hmm. Hey, this is that's that's the interesting thing though. They're only two pin, right? They're uh, be quite delicate with those, but there's only two pins on these so does that mean that they've got the circuitry in there to drive them higher and higher or is that some part of the physical uh construction of the tube when you apply voltage to it it naturally just goes up and up i'm i'm not sure of the exact mechanism of that wow interesting so i really love these russian tubes i'll get you a close-up uh in a minute but it looks like about um date code is that a date code of 84 perhaps i was still making these in 84 i'm not sure but these are fantastic and the data i've got a um i've got some info on these apparently they're not voltage driven they're current driven so what you do is you put like i think from zero to 10 milliamps uh constant current through them and that will light up the bar graph so oh, let's give it a bow unfortunately we can't see a huge amount inside this but uh due to this grid around the outside so let's um let's power it up i guess and uh see what it looks like so this is the um this one has the argon gas so it should show up purplish let's give it a go now, unfortunately, I'm not getting anything out of this at all, even with my compliance voltage up to uh, 100 volts. And I'm getting a, basically, there is nothing, I'm getting nothing on this. It's supposed to be like a linear um, bar graph from like 1 to 8 milliamps or 12 milliamps, depending on which data you believe. But I can only suspect that it needs a higher compliance voltage than 100 volts. All right, you'll have to please excuse the shame of using a multi-thousand dollar precision Keithley 2400 source measure unit to drive a Russian 
Bargraph vacuum tube, but uh, that's what I'm going to have to resort to here because it's got a compliance voltage that we can set to 150 volts, one milliamp. Let's switch it on. Woohoo! Look at that. We have ourselves a bar graph representing one, basically almost like one tenth or one eighth of that or whatever it is. And of course, it's drawing exactly one milliamp there with 150 volts compliant voltage. All right, let's find out at what voltage it complies that shall we let's go back down to 100 here and of course wah, see it's it's not drawing the milliamp it just can't um arc over and and drive the tube so if we increase our compliance voltage yet again 120 nah not quite 130 eh, getting there but nah 140 yeah, it'll get there with 140, but I, as it turns out, um, the people have done some data on this. Yeah, 150 volts, kind of like the nominal value. And there it is up close for those playing along at home. It's not terrific, and you get some glare off the glass and things like that, but eh, it's okay. It's kind of groovy, actually. Now, I'd love to be able to show you a bigger bar graph than that, but unfortunately... The limit at this compliance voltage on this thing is 1.05 milliamps. Wah. Now if we have a look at what voltage it's actually sustaining at, it's uh, running at uh, 1.05 milliamps. The compliance voltage is 150. Of course, that's what it'll allow it to go up to uh, at switch on. But if we go in there and actually measure um, what we're looking at, there we go. It's uh, actually 105 volts. So that's the uh, sustaining voltage of the uh, tube itself. The really interesting thing to note is bar graph there. Check it out. It doesn't, it seems to almost go that, like there's a center point there when it's like under a milliamp. So it's not very linear under a milliamp there, it seems. Ah, I can't get higher. Bugger. Now, I'm pretty sure this damn thing's capable of sourcing more than 1.05 milliamps. It might be in some, I don't know, software to find limit mode or something. Anyway, I gotta, yeah, I'll leave it. I gotta move on. Anyway, that's very cool. Thank you very much, Ryan. I'd love to do a project with these. I'd love to get like a hundred of them and build like an individual module, some huge big, you know, audio spectrum bar graph or something. Hmm, maybe I should get Dave working on that. Hmm, the other Dave, that is. Next up, one from China. Hi to all my Chinese viewers. Um, if you can get the EEV blog in China, I've had a bit of an issue with that. Uh, Chinese companies like uh, Rigol, uh, for example, want to watch my videos, but they often can't because they, well, they have to get them by some other means because they um, have YouTube and other restrictions in the country. It's a bloody annoying noise. It's my stupid phone! What? It's just having a complete fit! Look at it! Bloody, this is a LG, um, what is it? A, a bloody Nexus, googly Nexus LG Nexus 4, I think. And it's just, it's chucking a mental! Oh, what a piece of garbage! Unbelievable. It seems to be like, I think I've had that happen once before when it's like charging, when it's like right at the bottom end of the charging, it just goes mental like that. I don't know if it's like playing a freaking tune, whistling Dixie, telling me that it's, you know, there's something wrong with the charger. I don't know. Bloody heap of garbage. Bloody modern phones, smartphones. It dumb as bloody two bricks, tell ya. Anyway, this one's from, um, it's from Sparks. I guess. Um, I'm sure that's not their name. Maybe that's their company. They're in uh, Dongguang uh, District. Jeez. Kuaitao. Uh, I've got that wrong. I can tell you what it is. It's an RF measuring meter. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Just measuring meter, not RF measuring meter. It's a measuring meter. What does that mean? Anyway, they sent us something. Thank you very much. I guess Sparks is the... Hey! It's a cheap ass. <laughs> it's a cheap ass Dong Peng Diang Ji Chang. Oh, I think I know what's happened. Somebody's just ordered this on eBay. Um, yeah, so it's not the company. They've just ordered this heap of crap soldering iron on eBay. Oh my goodness. 
Oh my goodness, and it's Dong Guang. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's hilarious. Dong Ping, sorry. Dong Ping, Diang Kui Cheng. Um, soldering iron with a uh, conical tip which wiggles. <laughs> it's got unique patented wiggle action. <laughs> oh man, what a heap of garbage. I guess it'll get you out of trouble, but geez, um, yeah, youngsters out there. I mean, look, I started out with just a fixed temperature plug-in soldering iron like this. It was from Tandy, Radio Shack, rest their soul. Um, and, you know, and, you know, it got me through, right? It got me through my early years before I was 10, but, you know, I mean, oh, geez, that is quite possibly the crappest... That has to be the worst strain relief in the history of strain reliefs. Oh my god. Oh goodness, I don't even want to know how little this thing costs. But, oh look, you can see the element. See the ceramic element wiggling around in there. Ah, oh, that's just, that is shocking. Crap conical tip on it. And there she is, Dong Feng Diang Chi Guang. Maybe it's highly regarded in China. I don't know. Oh, 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 oh. Wow, look at that. I'm surprised. They've actually gone to a bit of trouble. They've actually put some, um, well, not heat shrink. They've got a, um, a sleeve over that mains wire in there but geez yeah anyway look at the lack of strain relief there that's just pathetic oh goodness and of course this crap on the end isn't going to do a damn thing it's ridiculous that is the most one of the most pathetic soldering irons i've ever seen in my life but yeah it probably heats up i'm not going to insult my decent solder by heating it up with this crap soldering iron and yeah i know i, I had a similar one, when I was a kid, it wasn't this crappy quality, but uh, yeah, just the mains, you know, there's no temperature control, it just plugs straight in, straight into the element, that's it. Oh, actually, mine, no, sorry, no, mine did have, I think my first one actually had the temperature, you know, you adjust it with a screwdriver, the pot in there, that uh, temperature, my, mine might have been temperature controlled, oh, jeez, I don't know, it's too long ago, I can't remember. Anyway, these fixed temperature... Um, well, these fixed element soldering irons, they're just awful. You can't control the temperature. So if you're a beginner out there, I've shown videos on how you can go buy a 15, I think it was 15 or $20 Heiko ripoff temperature controlled soldering iron. And that's orders of magnitude better than this thing. So yeah, don't bother. Next up, one from Seb Doris. Thank you very much, Seb. He's from um, Dublin, Ireland, is it? Yes, I think it could be from Ireland. Hi to all my Irish viewers. Awesome. Irish viewers are hilarious. I'm sorry, just, you just gotta love the accent, right? The Irish accent. Gotta love it. You can say anything, and it's funny. Unlike me, who's not really funny, just more sad. Anyway, thank you very much, Seb. We do have a note. Um, sending you one APC. Okay. So look, he's going to send a whole bunch of stuff. We've got some old school Casio. We do like old school calculators here on the blog. There's another one <laughs> in a cassette case. Yes, kiddies. Um, we had before, well, before the internet, iPods, MP3s and iTunes and all that bloody Apple um, rubbish. We had cassette tapes with our Sony Walkmans. Sony Walkmans. The wife was digging through, <laughs> digging through old stuff the other day, and she got out the Sony, found the Sony Walkman. It's not the original one. Um, I've actually been trying to get an original Sony Walkman, like the first one ever since I did that Sony video. I'd love to do a teardown in like the original 1979 one. And she even hand stitched back in the day. This is what you did, okay? You handmade your own little leather carry case, or, you know, yeah, is it leather? I don't know. Anyway, she hand-stitched her own carry case for her Sony Walkman. Look at that. We've got ourselves a little four-banger, as they're called. 
because they're a four-function calculator. That's what uh, us calculator aficionados call a four-function calculator. This one's actually got time, clock, and um, alarm, and lap function, and stopwatch in the little four-banger. Wow, the PW70 from Casio. Unbelievable. Let's have, look at this. This is what he sent in. It's an APC, APC who make the uh, power supply, you know, the UPS um, power supplies we've seen before. Um, this is a room monitor with a uh, power over ethernet injector that died recently. Fa fascinating little device running Linux and a stack of IO and sensors, huh? No, that's not that. That's the power over ethernet injector. Here we go. Oh, this is what he's talking about. Oh. <laughs> Look at that! Look at that thing! Wow! And it's yeah, I I haven't seen a Renet Bots room monitor. That is fascinating. I I haven't seen that before. So yeah, what? It's like home automation. Look. That's a. It's got a big big ass camera on the front. Okay, right. Wow. Okay, and it's got a, like a proper look. It's got a proper mounting lens, screw threaded lens, and everything. Wow. Jeez, that's pretty sophisticated for like a, a webcammy type room monitor. Wow. Unbelievable NetBots room monitor. Jeez, I have no idea. Some sort of APC home automation thing. And lucky last, oh, wow, I haven't seen that before. An 808 Rapid Man. Yeah, it's the Rapid Man. I'm going to carry around this on my calculator belt. You bet, in my. Um, it's a citizen, by the way. Yeah, I'm going to carry this puppy around on my belt, as you did in the 70s. They carry calculators around on their belt, and that's a little four banger with a um, probably a LED uh, display in the sucker. By the looks of it, maybe one of those bubble displays, perhaps. But uh, yeah, wow, a Rapid Man patent pending, made in Canada. Hi to all my Canadian viewers. So apparently, this thing cost fifteen hundred euros um, back in the day. I don't know how. Uh, long ago it was, did he say? Um, but 18 months of service had in there. Anyway, it's, yeah, it seems like it does a whole bunch of, like, a, you know, alarm sort of, like, control monitoring kind of things. So, yeah, I think they're trying to uh, get into the, you know, the traditional alarm monitoring market or something like that. And as I said, like, I'm really stunned that this uses look a threaded removable lens look at that oh open far near woohoo and there we go you can see the sensor there you go look at that the bare sensor die just mounting some sort of LLC package and uh, just mounted directly on the on the board there, that looks actually a, a reasonable size die for such a thing. Hmm, what is that, like 7 millimeters across or something? Well, and they've gone to the effort to put an O-ring down in there and everything. Wow! So Seb reckons this thing runs uh, Linux, and there's a whole bunch of sensors on the back. The Ethernet, power over Ethernet, has got some USB action happening, and some microphone and headphones, and ta-da! Two minute tear down. We're in like Flynn. And no surprises for finding this little uh, adapter board here with a, one of those SHT uh, temperature humidity modules on there. They're all the rage and uh, looks like we've got another couple of sensors in there as well. Don't know why they got that slot cut open, but that would do uh, temperature and humidity, I'm assuming. Wow, I quite like the modular construction of this thing. Check out the uh, switch in power supply here on its own module. I just thought that was bulging there for a second. No, I don't think so. Look, they've got the uh, cutouts for a little uh, top of the transformer and the big ass cap in there, and that just flips over 
and it goes in there like that. It's just ah oh, beautiful modular construction. There's quite a few boards in here actually. This looks like the main process, a dead giveaway when you've got a thermal pad on the bottom surrounded by a whole bunch of uh, bypass caps here and then bypass caps around here. So we've got a big ass BGA with like three rows of BGA pins or something like that. And all those gold pads you see on there, they're all uh, bed of nails test points. Do not flex. Well, we don't want to flex because it's got a big ass BGA on it. <gasps> Do you want to crack those balls? So the PCB designer here, fond of annotation, look, press here because that's where the board to board inner connect is. And by the way, look, they're using uh, standard uh, pin headers, uh, 0.1 inch uh, pin headers to go between board to board, bottom entry uh, type. And same with the ones on here, you can see the pins sticking out through the bottom of the board there. Very nice modular construction. So let's whip it open and press here, of course, again. Ta-da! Whoa, look at that. Huge monster down there. Let's take a look at that. This is a Freescale MPC 8248, which I'll link in down below. This is a PowerQuick 2 uh, communications security, uh, security communications processor, basically specifically designed for these sorts of applications. It's got, uh, you know, all the requisite uh, encryption and uh, communications stuff built in exactly for this task here. Got some battery backup there, but it's exactly what it's doing. Purpose designed for the task and obviously um, capable of running Linux in some form. Now this is really interesting. I don't know what's under there, but it's got what it's almost like it's like a, some sort of ferrite block on top, but I don't think it is. I think it's actually heat sinking. I'm not sure what they're doing there. Anyway, can I, can that wiggle off? Because, oh yeah, got it. Ah, ta-da. There we go. So that, I don't know, is that uh, uh, thermal um, adhesive pad? Hmm. Anyway, we've got ourselves an NEC processor down there. I have to go look that one up. That would obviously be doing a lot of the image and maybe sensor processing and stuff like that would be my guess. Well, that's weird. From what I can gather, this is a USB chipset used on PCI cards for those USB um, expansion ports. So that just seems a bit unusual in this application. I'm yeah, not sure what's going on there at all. Aha, uh -huh. so my thoughts of that uh, chipset being the video one, well, ill-founded, because, ta-da, a separate board here, once you get the main one off, it's got a Vicam 3 chipset Vista imaging. Never heard of it. I'll try and link in the data sheet. Well, there's no joy on that at first uh, search. If I can get anything, I will eventually link it in. But that's obviously doing all the heavy-duty uh, processing on the video camera, I'm not sure what the resolution the camera actually is. It must be pretty decent to have that decent lens on and everything else, but eh, I don't know, it could be pretty ordinary. You know, 640 by 480 even, uh, I don't know. I doubt it's like full HD, but anyway, it could be. That'll do a lot of your, uh, you know, your motion detection, because this thing does motion detection, and then it records when there's motion, and, you know, remote security uh, recording applications and stuff like that. So that's probably got, like, motion detection algorithms and all that heavy-duty stuff in there. You wouldn't be doing that in your Linux, um, on your Linux OS with your Linux processor. Most likely done in here. So this isn't just some sort of slap-together consumer product. This is actually a very well engineered, sort of more like, you know, a uh, commercial or industrial type market uh, product. And it's pretty well engineered. I'm very impressed. A lot of uh, hard work has gone into uh, doing this puppy. So thank you very much, uh, Seb, for sending this in. I might try and uh, maybe uh, power it up at uh, some point, see if we can do something. But yeah, I'm quite impressed by that. Made in Canada. Mmm, look at that. The Rapid Man. Yeah, Rapid Man 808, complete with operating instructions on the back. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. Wah, 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 wah. But there you go. I've never heard of a Rapid Man calculator. Anyone got the history on this puppy? Ooh, the poor old Rapid Man has not survived well. All that foam has just disintegrated. Look at that. And they've got little... They, these actually feel really good. Listen to that. 
These tactile dome switches feel fantastic. Wow, a lot of springiness, a lot of very solid and audible click on those. Wow, very impressed. And look at the size of the domes, of course, absolutely huge. But uh, there's our there's our LED display. It's not a bubble. Uh, it's not a bubble type display. There we go. That's really old school LED stuff. Look at that. Wow. Oh, look at that. Yes, it does smell as old as it looks too. 1974 vintage. Is that a Rockwell symbol? Is that Rockwell there? And with the um, I love the staggered dip lead configuration. Oh man, ancient stuff. There we, <laughs> we got ourselves a, um, a DC to DC converter in there. Old oh, dip tantalums. Oh, goodness. Got to have a couple of bodge wires on the back of the keypad there. But, geez, this has really seen better days. Oh, but, gee, um, anyone out there? Use a rapid man. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed Mailbag Monday yet again. Yes, I've got more stuff on the shelves. Looks like my uh, totalizer for the second camera here, my Canon HFG30, I've been going for 35 minutes of raw footage. So by the time I whack in the other stuff, uh, this one's going to be like a good 40 minutes uh, plus, maybe 45 minute episode. But people complain if I make my Mailbag too short. Go figure. Anyway, if you like Mailbag Monday, please give it a big thumbs up because that helps a lot and discuss it anywhere you like. I don't care. Just discuss it because that's all good. It's what it's all about. Catch you next time.